Welcome to this edition of Colorado Outspoken. I'm Stephen Montez. Tonight we'll be taking a look at the issues young people face when they realize that the gender equipment they have on the outside doesn't match who they are on the inside. Professor Fawn is back once again to give us her insight about dealing with issues you viewers have written to us about, and Rick Miller will get you caught up on the news. Of course, we have a great new movie that you can win free tickets to and the bulletin board. But first, let's talk to some people who know that ballet is more than slim young men in tights and pretty girls in tutus. Here's Eden Lane to explore Ballet Nouveau Colorado. The arts, theater, and dance community in Colorado reaches well beyond the known downtown Denver outlets that may be most familiar to you. And if you think that the quality and creativity diminishes as you look further away from the city center, we have a wonderful treat for you. Ballet Nouveau Colorado was established in 1992 and in 2005 grew to the second largest ballet company in Colorado. Now with the 2007-2008 season marks a quantum leap forward on the national stage. With me tonight are two of the company's driving forces. Executive Director since 1999, Lizzie Garrison. She joined Ballet Nouveau Colorado in 1995 as consultant to the Board of Directors and served as President of the Board for two years before assuming the role of Executive Director. Lizzie sits on the board of the Broomfield Chamber of Commerce, chairing the Marketing, Advertising and Communications Committee. Also with me is international award-winning choreographer and the company's new Artistic Director, Garrett Ammon. Garrett has danced with the Houston Ballet for two seasons, the Oregon Ballet Theater, and in 1999 he joined Ballet Memphis. He has danced lead roles in world premieres by Trey McIntyre, Julia Adam, and others, as well as principal roles in ballets by such notable choreographers as Georges Balanchine, B.B. Miller, and Donald Byrd. Welcome to you both. Thank you for taking time to be with us tonight. Thanks, Eden. Lizzie, I wondered if you could start us off by talking to us about Ballet Nouveau Colorado's search for a new artistic team. Why and what steps you took to get there? Well, it's such a great story. I actually love telling it. I sort of feel like I'm telling how mom and dad met <laughs> because it was such a great experience. Last year, it was our fifth season with our professional company, and we were starting to get quite a bit of national attention and at that time we found that our then artistic director was leaving so we did a national search having taken a foray into the national um, limelight as a company we were able to do this so we looked through dance magazine and point magazine and we looked nationally for a, a leader who could take us to the next level well the very first application that we received was a letter from Garrett and his wife Dawn actually as a couple wanting to come uh, and talk to us and actually we got I got boxes and boxes and boxes of applications but the very first one we got was a match that I couldn't have possibly imagined and their philosophy is so similar to ours and their vision and their drive and their goal for how to make ballet more exciting and more vibrant and more real in today's world is exactly what we're after and so we're so lucky that we found them and they came to us and the other exciting piece of this is they are or they were quite the big stars in the Absolutely. dance world and so for them to when they were retiring from a, a really brilliant performing career to decide to come to Valley Nouveau Colorado really put a lot of eyes across the country on our company so it's been a really exciting year. I was very excited when I heard that you were coming because I had even though I've been away from dance for so long had been aware of your career and Don's career can you tell me not only what your philosophy is that that matched so well with both Ballet Nouveau but what made you even be interested in coming to the suburbs of Denver Colorado? <laughs> <laughs> um, well we had um, we knew that we wanted to um, move into the position of directing uh, at some point and so we had been kept keeping our eyes open for a long time and Ballet Nouveau Colorado had actually been on our 
on our radar for quite a while. Um, I so we heard of you, you heard of us. Exactly, exactly. Um, the, the, the previous arti artistic director search they had done, I had already noticed, but we weren't at the point of making that transition. But um, I already had their, the, the contact information in my address book. And, um, and so when it came up, I immediately jumped on it, and um, I we knew about the Denver area and and so forth. But the more we learned about the company, the more we realized that it really was um, we felt that a, a, a perfect match. Um, it was, it's really a little gem, and even their studio doesn't doesn't lead one to believe they're in the suburbs of of any metropolitan area. So I'm sure that it was a big surprise when you finally got to visit. Absolutely, we were blown away. We. Um, we didn't know what to expect really um, arriving um, and to see these beautiful studios, uh, spacious studios um, that really allow dancers to to work at their fullest. Safe floors, good good environment. Yeah. How many dancers do you have in the company right now? We have 14 dancers right now. 14 dancers. And do you have any apprentices? Yes. Um, uh, two of those are apprentices. Two of them are apprentices. Um, when you and Don were still with um, Valley Memphis, were you a, a couple as a partnership as well as being married? Yeah, we actually, um, it's kind of rare in the dance world, I think, um, for couples to function the way that we do. Um, throughout our times, uh, we, we met in Memphis and um, we became partners on stage um, and off not long after um, a after I moved there and um, yeah we worked together all the time so um, it wasn't new when you got here to be having a working relationship you had already worked that out before you got here oh yeah it, very con uh, very uh, all the time really great yeah. um, I do want to jump right into your 2007 2008 season because it was such a sea change um, having been a fan of the company before I enjoyed the work but this was as I mentioned a quantum leap forward and can you maybe touch on how that's impacted your business and your attendance you know it's really opened a lot of doors for us I would say we've always grown very quickly we're a very strategic minded organization and so I'm really proud of that and we're all very focused on the vision of what ballet can become and how we can create change and impact in the community but having people who share the same level of vision on the artistic side has just enabled so much change to happen so quickly and so many doors are opening so many people are interested in talking to us as I said before eyes across the country are looking at us our you know very relatively young company this is our sixth season as a full-time professional company and it's pretty pretty young in the world of dance and to have the kind of people interested in us and working with us and collaborating with us has really been made possible by bringing in a, a team of the caliber of Don and Garrett. Well I was really looking forward to the seasoning season opening of the Nouveau Showcase which was at the Broomfield Theater called the Audi Theater attached to the library and um, I was lucky enough to be invited to attend one of your rehearsals and it was an amazing process and it was all built around music by Queen so uh, obviously that makes it acceptable to uh, accessible to a wider audience but could you also tell me maybe how that sort of exemplifies your philosophy of dance and how it ties in with Ballet Nouveau's philosophy absolutely and that that's where we found that match it's always been important to me as an artist that um, that dance be accessible um, all the time uh, that you that any person no matter what their experience they can sit down in the audience and feel comfortable and feel engaged and enjoy themselves while at the same time maybe learn something and maybe um, walk away having thoughts about about things but be entertained at the same time and not feel um, excluded or feel um, uh, uh, put off by the situation. And to use pop music in terms of uh, contemporary ballet is, isn't absolutely new at all. Twyla Tharp has done it for a long time when we were at the Joffrey, we, Frank Sinatra, all, all of those sorts of examples. But to choose Queen, what, what drew you to that sex, se section of music to be able to have your first showcase? Oh. Um, 
It, it, it was a process. I looked at a lot of different things, and I've I've done other work. I've done uh, work to develop it underground and to in excess, which we. Um, Do we get to see that? <laughs> uh, the, the in excess work yeah. will actually be on the pro, uh, on the season next year. Oh, great! Um, yeah. So. Um, I've always enjoyed Queen. Uh, my first ballet teacher actually introduced me to Queen when I was uh, when I first started training. And, and um, uh, what's the piece that we have a clip of now? It, it was the pas de deux. Um, there are two sections. There's a little bit of uh, a solo of the solo at the beginning, and then some of the pas de deux as well as the first group entrance. Um, it was a really exciting way to take the stage, um, both in that theater and in Colorado. And I have to say, I was so excited for the rest of your season, which of course included a Nutcracker, because we, we must include a right. Nutcracker when we're a ballet company, because <laughs> right. that's how we, we um, meet our bread and butter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the very next project was a complete restaging and, and almost re reimagining of Moulin Rouge. Can, can you tell me why, as a business, you chose to completely rework Moulin Rouge, and then what was your inspiration for so, so authentic <laughs> an interpretation of the time period. You know, we had done a version of Moulin Rouge two years back, mm -hmm. and it was just a one-act piece, and it was very much grounded and rooted in uh, a, a classical work. And uh, But the theme was very attractive to audiences, and although it was, it was rather popular, it wasn't so much in line with the new artistic identity. We have a very strong artistic identity that has developed very quickly now that Garrett is here. And so um, we aren't finding ourselves using a lot of our old repertoire. We're really looking at new things that this is a whole are. new score. Totally different, completely different. But the idea of Moulin Rouge is very compelling and so we had already thought of putting that on the on the season and so in conversations with Garrett once we once we, we hired him and we were talking about the season and he said you know I'd like to do it but I'd like to rework it and that's yeah I, because we didn't want to come in and try to completely you know throw everything upside down we because that would have been hard on the organization we wanted to make sure that they had already laid out a wonderful structure for the season so it was just finding a way to kind of redirect that into the vision that we were we were coming in with the, the so. dancers seemed seemed to thrive under all of this this new vision and these it's new challenges really you can you can see the spark in them mm -hmm. just in the rehearsal place um, the the level of detail in terms of selecting the music and even the characters you you cast in Moulin Rouge to the Bohemian period went so far as to include what might have either been a lesbian or a transgender character. Can you can you speak to that commitment to detail? Um, I thought it was really important um, when you look at um, art from the period and so forth that you see very plainly um, uh, a lot of different uh, choices, life choices and so forth, um, all existing together, espe especially in the bohemian world. So I wanted to make sure that that was that was portrayed. These very young dancers in your company attacked that with such commitment. Um, they, I've watched them become not just really good dancers, but real artists, and it was amazing to watch. And I, I've noticed that backing up to the Nutcracker, and I think partly with Moulin Rouge, you were able to co-opt um, materials or cooperation with other companies nationwide? That's another way that we've really uh, developed this network very quickly since Garrett and Dawn have come into our world. Um, they have connections that we didn't have. They have national um, relationships with other companies. And so, for example, with our Nutcracker, we had uh, sets and costumes from companies all over the country. So that was a huge step up for us in terms of production values and quality and, and just the enjoyment factor that we could provide for our audiences. And same thing happened with Moulin Rouge. And, so, yeah. and now with your current project, oh, the yeah. ending of the season is the, it's called the 20th Century Choreography Competition. 21st Century. 21st, 21st Century. <laughs> <laughs> and this began on YouTube. The, from all over the country, choreographers yep. submitted their samples yep. via YouTube for the general public to vote on. Yep. Whose idea was that? This was a, an idea that sort of, it was one of these incredible moments where the light bulb went off really all around the room. It was, there was, we had the idea of creating a competition, and that's not entirely new. But 
we all said, yeah, but what's great about a competition? Why is anybody going to want to see a competition? We want something that's going to engage people in a new way. Why is that going to be engaging? And we, it was literally hours sitting in a room. We locked ourselves in. and we t We'd had some experience with viral marketing that someone else had done. And we'd had some experience online. And so we you went with an talking. American Idol model. Sort of. Not, not too far off. But we were really talking about how do people talk. We, what we, were, we, we said, OK, is our, what is our goal here? Our goal is to make people engage in this process. It doesn't mean anything if we behind the scenes have a competition and pick a winner. It doesn't mean anything. But if we can get people, why is American Idol so engaging? Because people see the process. Why do you have dance shows on TV now? Mm -hmm. Ballroom dancing used to be kind of not that popular. Now all of a sudden it's super popular. Why? Because people have the chance to participate in it. Well, so just like with American Idol is yeah. now in its finals, you are also in your finals. Yeah. And you have three finalists, um, the first being Alex Ketley. Yes, Alex. And he has already come and gone to set his piece, is that correct? Yes, yes. He, what he, was that like? Um, wonderful. Alex is from San Francisco. Um, he uh, is one of the founders of a company called The Foundry. And um, wonderful experience. He's, he's an incredibly intelligent man and uh, really innovative ideas. Uh, he uses a lot of um, process in the studio with the dancers where he'll create movements and then manipulate it and distort it. And uh, really, really fascinating. And then the second finalist was Ma Kong. Yes. And his work. Uh, Ma Kong's from Tulsa Ballet, and um, his work is incredibly sensual. Um, it very influenced by Latin themes and and so forth. Uh, he's uh, the, many of the choreographers that he's worked with as well. The, a very circular movement style, but also tinged with a jazz feel to it. And then the the third finalist is Heather Malloy, and she just finished staging her work. Or is she still here? She's still here. Um, she's she will be finishing up. Um, the, the end of this week, and um, wonderful choreographer as well. She actually founded her own company in Asheville, North Carolina, and um, really talented, uh, very athletic. It's going to be it, the name of the work is Hurricane, and it's going to demand the most of the dancers, uh, stamina wise and, and, and physically. So. so now that you have your three finalists and you're almost done setting the pieces, when can we see it? You can see introductory videos about the choreographers that gives you a little bit of insight into their process and you can get to know them, see them a little bit in the studio. We already have those on our website. And then the performance? And then the performances are April 4th, 5th and 6th and 9th, or 11th, 12th and 13th. So we have six performances over uh, two different weekends and they will be judged. Each of the performances will be judged uh, by an industry judge. So we have very important um, judges from the dance world coming from all over the country. And the audience gets to judge? The audience gets to judge. There are four, basically four votes, a dance industry judge, uh, uh, somebody from the metro area cultural scene, Garrett, and the audience. We're using um, cell phone voting. And, and what venues um, are you doing these weekends? Be the in? first weekend will be at D.L. Parsons Theater in North Glen, and then the second and final weekend will be at the Lakewood Cultural Center. Great. Um, I want to know how do our viewers, those who haven't heard of Ballet Nouveau Colorado or those who haven't tried it since you've been here, how do they get tickets to this great weekend? Go on our website, which I would definitely recommend because you want to see our blog. You can get a lot of insight into these choreographers and know a lot about them before you come to the show. And the website is uh, bncevolution.com. Or you can call. Our phone number is 303-466-5685. And Garrett, you have a piece that's premiering during this particular week, these, both of these weekends, that's not mm -hmm. part of the competition, but um, another piece that you're mounting on the company. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. I'm really, really enjoying it. It's to music uh, by Joanna Newsom. And mm. um, really, really a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun to just explore this kind of quirky music and, and uh, try new things. Well, I know I'm looking forward to it, and I'm certain most of our viewers are as well. I know this has been a really busy week for you and with all these rehearsals, so I really appreciate you taking the time out to come and be with us tonight. And if you want to experience the evolution of Ballet Nouveau Colorado and help select the winner of the 21st Century Choreography Competition, call 303-466-5665 or log on to BNC's website at bncevolution.com to get your tickets now. My thanks to BNC's Executive Director, Lizzie Garrison, and the new Artistic Director, Garrett Ammon.
since you are watching this, chances are you value the kind of program that Colorado Outspoken has been producing for the past 18 years. As volunteers, we do this work because we believe that it's important for the LGBT community to have a voice. When we first began, there were no other outlets for information directed towards our community. Today we have channels such as Logo and OutQ Radio, but we continue because we believe that a local voice is still needed. We all want to know how local politics might affect our lives, what events are happening in the Denver area, and how the local climate is continually changing. We believe that you feel the same or you wouldn't be with us tonight. In order to continue being your source of GLBT news in Colorado, we need your help. It takes little money to put on this show, but it's money that we don't have. We ask you to show your support financially by going to our website, coloradoutspoken.org, and donating whatever you can. The least amount helps. Thank you for helping us make Colorado a better place to be for everyone. Are you up to speed on everything that's happening in the gay community? Well, that'd be really hard to do, especially if you didn't have the news on Colorado Outspoken to help you out. Here's Rick Miller. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee recently approved spending $50 billion worldwide over the next five years to combat AIDS and other diseases, especially in Africa. The legislation was jointly introduced by Democrats Joseph Biden and Edward Kennedy and Republicans Richard Lugar and John Sununu. This more than triples the $15 billion the U.S. had already contributed, which has allowed some 1.4 million people to receive antiviral drugs and more than 6.6 .6 million to receive care. The bill also repeals a 1987 law that prohibits HIV-positive people from entering the United States. The National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce has reached a deal with United Parcel Service to have LGBT-owned businesses take part in the shipping giant's supplier diversity program. Lisa Johnson, diversity manager for UPS, said expanding our process to include LGBT-owned businesses reinforces our commitment to supplier diversity. Implementation of a similar agreement between the NGLCC and Walmart failed in the wake of intense lobbying from social conservatives. Although the Anti-Gay American Family Association declared victory, the company being boycotted says it just isn't true. For two years now, the AFA has encouraged a boycott of the Ford Motor Company because Ford has advertised its products in GLBT publications. Ford did announce it will be spending less on gay marketing and support, but the cutbacks are due to the slowing economy and not because of any settlement with the AFA. Ford spokesman Jim Kane stated, I can tell you there was not a negotiated settlement to this boycott. A new law in Kansas aimed at preventing picketing at funerals was struck down by that state's high court. Oddly, it was a clause intended to avoid legal challenges that was found to be unconstitutional. The clause, which stipulated the law would not take effect unless it was judged acceptable by a state or federal court, was found to violate the separation of powers. The Kansas House Federal and State Affairs Committee is expected to take up a new version of the bill, which bans demonstrations within 150 feet of a funeral. A record number of gay candidates may be running for election to the New York City Council in 2009. Five out candidates are contemplating a campaign to become the first LGBT elected official to represent, appropriately enough, the Borough of Queens. The possibility of having so many gay candidates appears to be the result of the success of the borough's LGBT community in working with the local Democratic Party. Here's a story about seeking diversity even in the midst of diversity. It's a fact that most of the country's 400 openly gay elected officials are white. So the Gay and Lesbian Leadership Institute hopes to address this disparity by conducting its first political training program for gays of color this April. The organization also announced the new Bayard Rustin Award, a $1,000 annual prize recognizing the top academic paper on the topic of black gays and electoral politics. Recent gay-related crimes have a Florida community on guard. Melbourne Bruner, a gay resident of Fort Lauderdale, was attacked and beaten outside a diner three weeks ago. This attack occurred less than a day after the alleged hate crime shooting death of 17-year-old Simi Williams, Jr. 
Police are looking into whether the Bruner attack, during which a gay slur was used, was a bias-motivated crime. Remarks comparing gays to terrorists have focused attention on an Oklahoma legislator. Sally Kern, a state Republican representative, said in a speech that the homosexual agenda is just destroying this nation and poses a bigger threat to the U.S. than terrorism or Islam. Kern went on to say, gays have more suicides, there's more illness, their lifespans are shorter. Studies show that no society that has totally embraced homosexuality has lasted more than, you know, a few decades. It is not a lifestyle that is good for this nation. The entire speech has been posted on YouTube and has been downloaded more than a half million times. You can find a link to the recording on our website at coloradooutspoken.org. In an interview with an Oklahoma City television station, Representative Kern defended her anti-gay remarks, saying, there are indisputable facts that show it's a deadly lifestyle. In an email, Kern said, the homosexual agenda is real, the movement is aggressive, and it is a very real threat to the sacred institution of marriage and the traditional family unit. They have every right to choose that lifestyle, but I do not have to agree with it, and speaking against it is not hate speech. Another religious group has taken a position on gay marriage. A task force of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America issued a draft of a statement covering gay issues that, while it does not expressly condemn gay and lesbian relationships, expounds the belief that gays should be excluded from marriage. Emily Eastwood from the gay Lutheran group Lutherans Concerned North America criticized the draft saying this draft merely tolerates rather than celebrates the presence of same gender families in the church. It is inconsistent and insufficient. A gay Iranian man may get another chance. British authorities are reconsidering their denial for a petition of asylum by 19-year-old Mehdi Kasimi, who says he fears for his life in his home country, where his boyfriend allegedly was arrested, charged with sodomy, and hanged. Kasimi was denied asylum in Britain last year. He then sought refuge in the Netherlands, which this week also rejected his application. ABC Television's Barbara Walters was honored recently at the 19th Annual GLAAD Awards. The Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation recognized Walters for a 2020 report on transgender children. Walters said, you can forget all the Emmys, this means more to me. Other winners included the Hebrew and Arabic language film, The Bubble, Black Entertainment Television, and The J Channel. Judy Shepard and MTV executive Brian Graydon both received honorary awards. Until next time, this is Rick Miller for Colorado Outspoken. Youth is a time for discovering who you are, but some of us make discoveries that raise other issues. Here's Vaughn Oates to explore trans youth coming out. This year at the Colorado Gold Rush, there was something different. For the first time, we saw the inclusion of transgender youth and their parents. The idea that children deciding that their gender identity doesn't match their bodies is not a new one. Most transgender people will describe events very early on in their lives that indicated their dissatisfaction with their gender. The fact that some parents are now deciding to support these choices and allow their children to publicly live as the other gender is new and a perhaps revolutionary concept. Tonight I have the great pleasure of talking to Michelle Benzer Marquez, the proud mother of a 15-year-old trans girl who is now going to school as the person she knows she is, rather than the boy that we believed her to be. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Dr. Elizabeth Bethay is a psychotherapist specializing, specializing in LGBTQI issues. She has taught all over the metro area and is now researching the biological basis of gender identity. Elizabeth works closely with trans youth family allies and is the co-president of Boulder County PFLAG. Thank you for being with us, Elizabeth. Thank you, Fawn. Well, Elizabeth, let's start at the very basics. How is transitioning different for children than it is for adults? Well, in order to talk about gender transition, we need to define several words that we, or concepts that we, that we use. We need to look at the differences between biological sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation. So our biological sex is the appearance of the genitals at birth, whether male, female, or intersex, which is a condition of ambiguous or a combination of male and female um, characteristics. And in most of these cases, the biological sex, there, there's not a question of that. Is that yes, true? Yes, that's right. Um, 
with with gender identity, this is our innate inborn sense of, of being male, female, or uh, a fluid uh, variation of those two, or some people even identify as being beyond gender. And this is something that's formed in utero. Uh, due really? To so there's a biological basis for the psychological absolutely, part of Absolutely, yes. Gender. From the medical research that we have to date, we know without any doubt the exact part of the developing fetal brain in which mm -hmm. those, those that uh, that determines the gender identity. And depending on the, the level of male hormones or female hormones, estrogens or androgens, uh, that, the, that the fetus is exposed to during that critical developmental period, um, that determines the, the gender identity. And that would be the same regardless of when you're coming out as transgender. Yes. Is that true? Yes, exactly. And so and so that's so that's very that can often be very different than the than the biological sex that we're assigned at birth and that's what we see with transgender people. Sexual orientation is, is something that happens later in a person's life, um, starting around adolescence. And um, that is the, the um, attraction, the emotional and, and physical attraction to one sex or the other or to both. And so, so people's sexual orientation can be gay, lesbian, bisexual, um, um, asexual, pansexual. Uh, there are many different variations. And Do these, people often confuse sexual orientation with gender? Absolutely. And that's why I wanted to start with these definitions, sure. because, because our gender identity is something that is inborn, it's innate, and it's biologically determined, and it is pretty well set by the toddler years. Sure. Um, sexual orientation doesn't develop until, until later, and so we don't want to confuse gender with sexuality. And that often is the case, is it not? When we're, we're dealing with, with young children who yes. are trans, we think maybe the sexual orientation is coming up, so we kind of sexualize these children. Exactly. Is that, is that what you were finding when your daughter came out? When I realized that there was something different about my daughter, mm -hmm. I did go to that, um, to that area and thought maybe she was gay. Sure. Because I didn't realize that there was transgender and then there was the, gen the gender identity and the sexual orientation. And so for a while there, I did try to make her gay, yeah. <laughs> try to provide role models for her sure. and, and have her feel comfortable because that's what, what I thought that she was going to be, was grow up and be gay. Because that's what our culture mm -hmm. says, that there's some kind of variance in how we act. It that it's always be. sexual orientation, yeah. not gender identity. But that's not what we're seeing with these kids. It has nothing to do with sexual orientation. Exactly. Exactly. And so when we talk about the difference between a child making a, tra a, a gender transition versus an adult, it's kind of a good news, bad news scenario. Sure. The good news is the younger a person is when she or he realizes um, this, this fact about her himself, the easier it is to make a successful um, transition. And that's for, that's for several reasons. Um, and, and when we're talking about children, we're talking about completely reversible changes at mm -hmm. first. We're not talking about anything irreversible until the child is much older. We're not doing sex reassignment exactly. surgery. Exactly. No surgery and no hormones right. um, until much later. And so everything that's done is, is reversible in the earlier years. But it makes sense that if we can um, if we can support a child in being congruent in her outer presentation um, in school, for instance, wearing the wearing clothes, using a name, having having the correct sex friends, um, that kind of thing. So it's um, more of a social integration. Exactly, sure. it's a social transition, and the earlier we can support that, the more integrated and congruent the child will feel, which has many benefits down the road in terms of psychological health and physical health. Um, it, it also saves the child the, the, um, the physical ordeal of going through puberty mm -hmm. in the wrong sex, and then later on as an adult having to try to reverse all of those hormonal and physical developmental changes that occurred. And so there, there are those kinds of, um, kinds of advantages. And, and because it's, there's a, it's a child, it's not only the child that's going through all these changes, but it's the parents as well. Exactly. Yeah, Michelle, would you tell us a little bit about the kind of the process you had to go through to accept it. That maybe well, I've given that a lot of thought because I've been asked that question on mm -hmm. several occasions and I'd have to say that um, part of the process begins with the realization, realizing for myself that at the time my daughter, um, Manuel, and I will use the pronouns, um, sure. he and she, I had to realize, come to the realization that he was different. 
I thought that it was just a phase that he liked playing with Barbies and kitchenettes and dressing up and running around the house with high heels. But the realization set in when I, because it wasn't a phase. And I had to realize that, that no, it wasn't going to go away and this is who he was. And then moving on to the next step would be the step of acknowledgement. Acknowledging that my son was different and uh, by uh, providing the, the toys that he wanted, which were Barbies and kitchenettes, allowing him to dress up, giving him a little bit of blush and lip gloss, just like anything that any other young child, a, a female, would be experiencing as they're growing up. Do you think in some ways that might have been the hardest step, that, that just coming to the conclusion that, yes, my child is transgender? and. Uh, the hardest part um, was acknowledging that, yes, that, yeah. that she was uh, transgender. Uh, part of that acknowledgement was actually having to say it out loud for myself mm -hmm. for the first time. Sure. And that happened when I was called into school for a meeting because uh, my son at the time was being bullied, teased, harassed because he would stand in the cafeteria and uh, toss his hair and add a little lip gloss and have mannerisms that were typical of a female. Right. So I was asked to come into school to discuss that. And that was the first time that I actually had to say, did you know that my son Manuel is transgender? No, of course I knew they didn't know, but that was more therapy for myself because at that sure. moment I had to decide, was I going to step and sit up and support my child sure. or was I going to let this go and be my, have, have my child be labeled as a psychologically unbalanced or, or, or worse, just strange or weird, bizarre individual. So that was the acknowledgement part for me was to be able to say, I have a transgender son. Do you Very know what powering. this means? Yeah. Yes. And even though inside I was shaking, I knew it was important that I say that. It was the very first time I had said it. Acceptance came along with educating myself and learning what it means to be transgender, how I could support my daughter, what I needed to do to help her transition. So spending a lot of time on the internet, going to PFLAG meetings, introducing myself, building a network of support and friends, uh, belonging to trans support groups just surrounding myself, investing myself sure. so that I could educate myself and then also help my daughter educate herself in what was going to happen in her, tra her transition. And it sounds very similar to some of the things that, that parents will do when their, their child is gay and they're, they're realizing mm -hmm. that and accepting that. Uh, Elizabeth, do you think that's, that's very typical of, of how a parent reacts when they, when they acknowledge their child is gay? Well, it really depends on the parent. Oh, excuse me, trans. Yes, and, and you know, we would hope that, that every parent would be as open and accepting and affirming as Michelle has been with her child. You know, we don't always sure. see that, and, and um, we see the, the consequences in terms of later depression and, and self-destructive behaviors and even suicide. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons that we want to try to catch this as early as possible and support parents so that they can have the information, the perspective they need in order to support their child. Do you think more people are supportive because there are more role models like Michelle? I mean, I mean, you're really a pioneer. <laughs> I don't want to butter you up too much. But I really do believe that, that you and these other parents are really pioneers in this. I think that people are becoming more supportive because uh, as my daughter pointed out, you hear the word transgender probably more often than the last couple of years. Yeah, At least sure. that's what when we are driving down the road and it's on the radio or we see programs on TV. And she ha had asked me about two years ago, Mom, why all of a sudden are, are the, is the word transgender being right. used? And I said, that's a positive thing. Yeah. That means the world is waking up, they're coming around, and they're understanding that there is yet another diversity. Um, because there's more support groups. I looked for books. I looked for, for things that could educate me, and it was difficult. I couldn't find another mother at the time, another family. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were transgender adult individuals, but that wasn't the same as having mm -hmm. a trans child. Sure. And so I felt very alone at the time, and so having the support and having people who have other children, I think that we're going to grow and be able to encourage and help our children to transition successfully. And it's great to have that support, to have other parents that you can talk to about what you're going through. Sure. It's also good for the children to be able to see other children. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, anytime you, you see somebody who is like yourself, that's mm -hmm. going to make you feel better about yourself. Exactly. Absolutely. Elizabeth, is that same kind of pattern that you're seeing? Yes, and you know, one of the positive things about that is that the younger children are, the more open and accepting they are of whatever the gender presentation mm -hmm. of one of their peers. And so that so kids can be accepted and integrated in their correct gender much earlier now because mm -hmm. of this, this recognition and, our, and parents like Michelle supporting their children and making the, the transitions. Um, some models for behavior. Exactly, ex 
Exactly. And, um, you know, if we, when we, you know, c contrast that with adults who are trying to transition, if we think about the, the people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s who are making a transgender, uh, who are making a gender transition after so many years of having gone through childhood and puberty um, as, as the wrong sex, and, um, you know, then later developing the secondary sex characteristics, for instance, for transgender men, having the high voices, the breast development, the menstrual periods, for transgender women, you know, having the, the heavy facial and body hair, the Adam's apples, the deep voices, the heavy musculature, and all of that has to be reversed, and, and clearly that's that's going to be much harder and take much more hormonal and surgical intervention to do that in money, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, later in life than if we do it, than if we support people in making well, that And with money. anything, it seems the earlier we get to catch exactly. it, the, the better we are. Exactly. <laughs> it seems that, that one of the hardest parts of transitioning has got to be school. Um, Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about how, how you made this a smoother process with the school when your daughter was transitioning? I'd like to believe that we made this a smoother process because we were looking at it and making it a win-win. A win for the school because we wanted them to be educated and a win for my daughter because we wanted her to be safe, to be socially integrated into the school and receive the education and, and the experiences of a young adolescent that she's entitled to. And what we did was we established allies like the school psychologist, the principal, they were definite allies in our school. And then what we did was we tried to educate ourselves, all that individually, but um, the principal did, the school psychologist, and myself. We met um, throughout the year and tried to establish what would be a good time frame for her to, to transition and what we were going to do, what was that going to look like. Mm -hmm. We also made a survey for the staff so that they could put down any questions and answers, any con concerns that they might have, anything like that. And then we met over the summer before uh, Melena actually transitioned and uh, just thought of everything that could possibly go wrong and try to find a solution yeah. for that. Melena, what restrooms was she going to use? Was she going to be participating in sports? How would we answer to parents? What would so we answer to, to sounds children? Sounds like a huge amount of forethought mm -hmm. really went into this. A, a lot, lot of, of forethought, a lot of planning, a lot of meeting. We had a great team, our psychologist, uh, the principal, the school psychologist, the counselor, myself, and I wasn't involved in every single meeting, yeah. but whenever that there, there were questions and there was concerns, they'd always say, Michelle, can you come in here? We'd like to ask you about this. What do you think? They also Ask Melinda to make a list. What did a successful year look for her? Look like to her? What did she want? And she wrote down, "I want to be called a girl's name. I want the teacher to say she. I want the kids to say her. I want to play volleyball. I want to be able to use the restrooms." And and so the principal went to the district and we tried to make sure that the things that she wanted that would help her feel successful and be a part of the school and feel completely and totally herself w that we could do that for her. So it was really driven by by her, mm -hmm. by, by your daughter. And you know that's that's the one thing that we need to understand that um, that a lot of the things that I have done and, and more than likely other parents do is we do what is best for our children. What um, They dictate to a point. Sure. There are things that I needed to do for Milena that when I thought she was ready if she was psychologically okay, was she mature enough, did she make a request, sure. I had to balance it out, and, and I didn't let her dictate like um, she just said she wanted to do something and I said okay sure. And uh, just very briefly because amazingly enough we're running out of time, um, <laughs> what, do you, what do you say to the people who, who link allowing your child to transition almost with child abuse? that it's damaging and it can affect their whole future. It's absolutely the opposite because mm -hmm. my daughter was ha having depression and not good grades and, and she wasn't very happy and now if people would give her a chance and be able to see her, she's blossomed into a beautiful young lady, mm -hmm. her grades are better than ever. We encourage them to have self-esteem, we allow them to be who they are meant to be, to be productive individuals in society. And my daughter has done a full turnaround and is beautiful, is smart, and is just experiencing life as any typical female. And so instead of looking at it as child abuse, it's helping her to be who she was meant to be. And she's going to be a better person for that all around. It sounds like a great success story. It has been, thank goodness. Uh, well, Elizabeth, what do you think um, are, are the, the biggest issues? What, what would you want people to know about transgender youth? Well, I think the most important thing that, that we, and this is a fact, that we all need to keep in mind is that being transgender is not a choice any more than being homosexual is or bisexual. Or left-handed. or <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And so, um, so knowing that and, um, and, and making that separation between gender identity and sexual feelings and behavior, I think those two are very, um, very, very important.
that gender identity actually happens much earlier, at least exactly. according to development, when we kind of figure out gender. Exactly. It seems to happen much, much earlier. Exactly. We come into life with it, and it's, it's fairly well set by the toddler mm -hmm. years. Michelle, what would you want people to know about transgender youth? I would want them to know that my daughter and all the other children are just like all the other kids. Mm -hmm. That they're entitled to an education if they're in school, that they're entitled to live life, they're entitled to be safe. And that's yes. our number one priority is to make yes. sure that the children are safe and that they're being treated with dignity and respect. They're not, it wasn't a choice, they didn't ask for this, they're just trying to be themselves and live life just like the rest of us in the world. Sure. And if we could give them that opportunity and learn from them, they are the next generation and I have high hopes and faith for the future. I think the future looks much brighter because of people like you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Elizabeth uh, th and, and Michelle, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I, I really do think that we're in a paradigm shift right now, and, and it is because of, of people like you who are, are leading the pack. Definitely. But as always, we, we've run out of time, and I, I just I can't tell you enough how much I enjoyed talking to you, and I hope that I can have you back again. So I'd like to thank my guest, uh, Michelle Benzer Marquez and Dr. Elizabeth Bethay. Thank you for joining me and changing the world one person at a time. Sex can be great, sex is fun, sex is best wins one on one, but also can, can be confusing. To help you realize fun and remove the confusion, we have our very own sex advisor. Here's Professor Fawn. Tonight we have a very exciting selection of questions that involve everything from multiple partners to finding an alternative to sex reassignment surgery. And I don't want to waste another minute, so let's get started. Dear Professor Fawn, a buddy of mine is dating another really good friend. How can I convince him to stop visiting a sex website where he claims to be just talking to his other friends? One of those other friends sent him a text message that I happened to read and it wasn't something that you can say on air. What advice can you give? Signed, Prince Albert. Well, Prince Albert, it's, it's always tough to be in the middle of a situation like this. And you may be trying to protect your friend while at the same time trying to allow him to make his own decisions. When it comes to your friend, he may be getting something out of the sex websites that he doesn't feel that he's getting in the relationship. This could be many different things, including a safe place to express all of his sexual desires. If you feel that you must intercede, you could talk to him about what he likes about those sites. If you approach it in a non-judgmental way, he will be much more likely to talk to you honestly. The problem is, what do you do with that information? Ultimately, this is between your friends as a couple. You can encourage them to talk to each other and even seek couples counseling if they don't know where to start. But I encourage you to take a step back and evaluate what part you want to play in their relationship. Dear Professor Fawn, I've always thought of myself as being female even though I'm a genetic male. I find it very hard in the gay community to find guys who would not be put off by me becoming more female. I desperately want to appear to the world as a woman, yet retain my penis. So how in the world do I classify myself? Where can I get help in understanding this? Signed, Little Red Riding Hood. Well, Little Red Riding Hood, as we've talked about on tonight's show, our culture is very uncomfortable with the idea of switching genders in the first place. Our solution to this problem is through medical science. The idea is that we, if we can make people fit our idea of what a man or a woman should look like, then everybody can be comfortable. Well, and the solution is not limited to transgender people. If you feel that your breasts are not big enough, or your penis doesn't have enough girth, there are surgeries available. However, surgery may not be an option for some due to health or financial concerns, or simply that they don't want to undergo the knife. It's incredibly common for trans men or female to males to never have genital surgery due to some of these constraints. And of course, until the 1900s, surgery wasn't even an option, yet there were untold numbers of people living as the opposite sex. In our society, there is a lack of classification when it comes to the many ways to express transgender, transgenderism. A rarely used but available term is non-op transsexual, meaning that an operation isn't expected or planned. The good news is that you don't really need to classify yourself. You know who you are and you're comfortable in your body. Very few of us feel completely comfortable summing up who we are with a label anyway. Does, it, does saying that I'm a lesbian really give you much information about who I am? Human variation is incredibly wide-ranging and complex, and that's really the beauty of nature. In a community that defines itself by diversity, shouldn't we be the first ones to really embrace it? If you want to learn more about this topic, go to our website at coloradoutspoken.org, where you'll find links to several transgender sites, as well as Colorado's own Gender Identity Center. 
Dear Professor Fawn, love the show. I have friends that have been together for 13 years. They have an open relationship. What kind of advice would you suggest for them to not have an open relationship? Are there any sex toys or anything that would keep them monogamous? Signed, Topper. Dear Topper, well, first of all, I'm glad that you like the show. Secondly, if your friends have been together for 13 years, they must be doing something that works for them, so give them a little bit of credit. If exploring other partners is new to them, it may be a way of spicing up the relationship or a way of looking elsewhere for sexual outlet. According to studies, gay men are much more likely to have non-monogamous relationships than women or straight men. Our society is even less accepting of multiple partners than it is of homosexuality. In fact, over 90% of people disapprove of sexual non-exclusivity. We have an expectation of monogamy, but this doesn't mean that open relationships have to be damaging to the relationship. However, they can be very difficult. Here are some of the things to remember if you are considering such a relationship. The most successful open relationships involve a strong commitment to the primary relationship. Just because you have outside sexual partners doesn't mean that the original partnership is invalidated, but it does need to be seen as the most important. The people that are brought into the relationship have to be fully aware that they are not the primary partner. There also needs to be a high level of affection, trust, and communication between partners. Jealousy is usually harmful to any relationship, but in these cases it really can be deadly. As a general rule, if you are unable to have a conversation about it, maybe you're not ready to do it. One of the things people find the most helpful is to agree on a set of rules, such as having to agree uh, on the third partner, or affairs can only happen out of town, or whatever makes you comfortable. Continue to revisit these rules and change things if necessary. If something happens that makes you uncomfortable, talk to your partner about it and come up with a new solution. Finally, make sure that both of you are vigilant about using condoms and other forms of protection. Bringing home a sexually transmitted infection is not going to be welcome regardless of what kind of relationship you're in. If you decide that an open relationship is not the right path for you, then there are plenty of things you can do to spice up your sex life. There are many toys, films, games that you can explore with your partner. There is no one item that will work for everyone. Go to an adult bookstore together and find something that excites both of you, or expose your partner to something that you previously have enjoyed. Either way, your sex life is going to become more interesting and more satisfying. If you have a question that you'd like answered, just go to our website at coloradoutspoken.org and navigate to the Sex Advisor page. You can submit your questions and you can read the ones asked by others along with my answers. Questions submitted online may be selected to be included in our next show. So until next time, I'm Professor Fawn. Have fun and play safe. Skateboards, trains, young men in the shower, and murder? It's all in tonight's movie. Crafted by openly gay writer-director Gus Van Sant, here's Paranoid Park. There's something that happened to me. I thought so. What I would do is, I'd write a letter. Save it, send it, burn it. It just feels good to have it all out. One day, halfway through math class, there was an announcement. What we have is a possible murder situation. Take a look at these pictures and you're going to understand why we're here. I had tried to put this part out of my mind, but the picture brought it all back. Dude, we should go check out Paranoid Park. But I don't think I'm ready for Paranoid Park. Yeah, but no one's ever really ready for Paranoid Park. I like it right away. Train hoppers, guitar punks, throwaway kids. They built the park all by themselves. So where do you guys live? Right here, man. So you want to ride a train, man? All right. What was I going to do? I really wanted to ride a freight train. Woo! You like this train? You taking it? Well, hide, man. Hide, hide. Police are investigating a grisly scene at the central train yard near downtown Portland. I'm sure you act weird sometimes, because you'd think after what we did, you'd be a little more happy to see me. I talked to your friend Jared. He says you almost went by the skate park on the night of the 17th. Let me tell you what my situation is. We have a witness that says he saw somebody throw something over the bridge into the river. We happen to have that object, and it's a skateboard. If you have anything to add, give me a call.
If you'd like to go see this movie for free, we can make that happen. Just go to our website at coloradooutspoken.org and enter your name in our drawing. We'll be giving a pair of tickets to 10 randomly selected people. To complete your entry in the drawing, you'll need the code word. For this movie, it's murder. Paranoid Park is now playing at the Mayan. Hey guys! Your business can be a part of Colorado Outspoken. You can have your logo at the beginning and end of each of our programs. And on our website. We have sponsor packages for any pocketbook. Send an email to sponsor at coloradooutspoken.net or call us at 303-861-0829. I will contact you personally and you can be a sponsor of Colorado Outspoken. Well, that's all we have for this edition of Colorado Outspoken. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in just a month, so please tune in on Sunday, April 27th, right here on KBDI Channel 12. Until then, you can always visit us online at coloradooutspoken.org. Drop by and talk to our sex advisor. See what's going on in our community and watch the show as many times as you can in their entirety. Until then, I'm Stephen Montez. Good night.